welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. The special guest host this week, part two, Brian Knoll, is back with us here on Zoom uh, for taping. Welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for having me back. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to be here uh, twice in a row. Yes, yes. We, we got so excited last episode. We had four movies to talk about, and then we got, they were just such interesting thought-provoking films we spent the whole episode on two so we have two more left so we're going to get to those today um, but first off uh, brian and i wanted to do a little bit of a tribute um, to the late great christopher Plummer, who uh, recently passed away at the ripe age of 91 so good long life um, remains i think to this day his record is that he's a, the oldest uh, academy award winner um, he won the academy award for um, a film that's actually one of my favorite performances of his, which is uh, Beginners, uh, directed by Mike Mills, um, where he plays uh, Ewan McGregor's father, who um, in, in his older years comes out of the closet and kind of throws his son for a loop. <laughs> and so, and it's just one of these great, um, Christopher Plummer is an interesting actor in that um, he, he's been famous for a really long time, uh, you know, 50, 60. Well, he started acting in his early 20s, so 70 years. Um, but in some ways, his, his later stage of his career to me was the most interesting. Um, so Beginners is one of my favorites. I'm curious to hear from you, uh, Brian, one of your favorite. Some yeah, of your very favorite much. Christopher I, Plummer roles. I, I, I love Beginners very much as well. I, um, and I think he was even subsequently nominated one more time and became one of the oldest nominees um, after Beginners. But I, that, that is one of my favorites. I will say, actually, I have a... a trifecta of favorites, I guess, of Christopher Plummer performances. One, uh, he plays Mike Wallace in the movie The Insider, which I, yeah. that, that sort of put him back on my radar at that point. Um, not that he'd fallen off completely, but I hadn't been seeing him in major films that I remembered. And then he plays Mike Wallace in that film. And I, I love that. And then my two favorite performances of his, um, he sort of plays elegant villains. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the 2006 Spike Lee film, uh, The Inside Man, uh, oh. which he is incredible in and, and rather chilling at some point. Uh -huh. um, and then the other film I love him in is the 2009 film Up, where he does a voice performance as, again, um, an elegant villain, uh, Charles Muntz in that film. So those are my three with beginners, a closely just outside my top three. And then um, I was just talking with a friend uh, last night, uh, shout out to the East Bay, um, <laughs> about his one of his more recent film, Knives Out, which he's excellent. In. I, I was going to mention Knives Out, so that was the other one I was going to mention, um, which is a smaller role, and, and he's playing a sick old man. But the thing about Christopher Plummer is that he exudes so much intelligence and like fierceness. This is why I think he played conniving villains later in his life you know, so well, because he has this, um, this, you can't push, you can't pull anything over him type of feeling about him, that even though he's playing, um, you know, someone, you know, quite appropriately, that's this, you know, much older man who's has these health problems, you know, that something's going on with his character and knives out, which is part of the fun of the mystery of that film and the twistiness of it is not yes. sure what this old codger is up to exactly. So, um, and then, you know what? I forgot to write down the name of the movie, but maybe you'll remember. He also, the other one he was nominated for, I believe, was the All the Money in the World. Is that the, did I have yes, the name right? Yeah, I believe so. That's the. That seems like the right, which I was not a movie I loved, but as a movie, but his performance in it is phenomenal. Yes, another chilling performance where uh, something that I think about, he, he often seems to be the smartest person in the room. And maybe in these villain roles that comes off deviously and that that's what makes it that much more chilling. Yeah, exactly. And he, uh, he's really, of course, uh, folks also know him from The Sound of Music. I almost didn't want to bring that one up because I cringed when I saw so many headlines after he passed that said Sound of Music actor Christopher Plummer. And I thought, I know that's probably the most famous, but it's by no means his great best performance, not even close. And so that was why I I always cringe when I see things like that. <laughs> yes, the moment though that he stands firmly in popular culture for sure. Yeah, that's true. Uh, right, so he will be missed. Um, and uh, but you know, nineties is is uh, there's no shame in that game. So <laughs> yes, and over two hundred films, I think. I, I was trying to look at which ones I had seen, and with that many, there's many I haven't seen. So oh yeah, I'm sure. A lot of work I'm sure. To do. 
and like I said, I think there was a couple decades there where I feel like he kind of disappeared. He was probably working, maybe he was doing TV. And I just, yeah, like you said, when he came back in the insider, I thought, oh yeah, okay, there he is. But yes. you know, like, I don't remember what he did before then for like 10 years. So I'll have to look it up. Good. Okay, right. so do you want to start, kick us off with our first review? Yes, yes, I will. Um, so um, Bella Tarr's 1988 film, Damnation, was recently made reavailable just this year, or actually last year, 2020, in a new print uh, by the Film Society at Lincoln Center. Uh, and it, it was hands down the best film I saw in 2020, and in my estimation now sits at the top in terms of the best films of the 1980s. So this is a film that made a huge impression wow. on me. So I was overjoyed um, when we discussed watching The Man from London, uh, Bellatar's 2007 film that he co-directed with his partner, Agnes Renitsky. Um, this film is based on a novel by the great Georges Simonin who gave us um, the, the spectacular May Gray character in novel form and later in um, and this became the nom de plume from one of, for one of our dear friends. So May Gray holds a special place in my oh, film, which makes okay. this uh, film that much cooler. Um, the Man from London uh, is an exquisitely photographed story. It tells of Malion, a railway switch operator in a French harbor who witnesses a crime, actually two crimes, and then uh, profits from it. This is followed by a corresponding um, moral shift or moral decay in his own life, uh, and then a bit of a detective story. But the real story for me is the technique that is used to give us this uh, setting um, and these characters. So when I was younger, um, I always wanted to be the hero character in the films that I watched, but now all I want to do is Ten Bar and a Bellatar film wearing a saggy and ill-fitting vest um, while melancholy accordion music plays in the background. Um, Angela, were you similarly taken by the man from London? <laughs> well, I don't think I want to be an old man in a bar wearing a saggy vest, if that's the question. But you know what I will say is I've only, I've seen one other Bellatar film, which I know is a little bit embarrassing for a real film snob because, um, but to my credit, most of his movies are four to seven hours long. I think the one of them is eight, seven or eight hours. So, you know, I'm just saying, yes. you don't always have a lot of time on your hands for eight hour Hungarian cinema. Uh, all of his films that I'm familiar with are black and white. The one I've seen before, I've not seen Damnation, the one you mentioned. I've seen the Workmeister Harmonies, which is a super uh, interesting movie that's extremely grim. So this is a, a constant in a lot of his films. One of the things that is so interesting about his movies is he shoots in black and white in a way I, you rarely see anyone shoot. It's not the classic 1930s Hollywood black and white where everything is much more beautiful and everyone has this sheen to them. It is beautiful black and white, but it's beautiful in this like, it, some of his blacks are blacker than any black you've ever seen in your life. And sometimes characters will come out of the blackness and he uses black and white in such interesting ways. The opening shot of this ship that's coming into the harbor and the way it comes, it's like the, the shot goes on for 10 minutes and then you just sort of slowly see that, that you can see these figures emerging out of the darkness. You're almost kind of, I actually kind of leaned into my TV <laughs> like trying to see what was going on. Um, there's certain aspects of his work that reminds me of Tarkovsky and that he uses long shots to draw you in because you're just thinking something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And sometimes in the case of Bellatar, not really much happens. So I will warn viewers who do not have extremely long attention spans. I always hate to ward people off of great art, but this is not for everyone. His films have really long shots. They're very long. This We picked this one partially because it was one of his shortest films. Because we, we looked at doing a, diff a couple different ones like the Turin horse, but they're all three, four or five hours. And so I was like, oh, this one's like two and a half. Let's go with that one, <laughs> Brian. Well, and I watched I it twice though. So that kind of defeated that purpose. I know I you ended up spending six hours, hours with it anyway, right? Um, but, you know, uh, I, I saw one description of this film that described it as slow motion noir, which I kind of liked that, yeah. that description. But, you know, the thing I have, I can't say it's one, I can't believe you watched it twice. I didn't love this movie. 
Um, I think there was a couple of things that were distracting for me. One, Tilda Swinton is in it as the, as the man's wife. And I actually found that a little distracting because I'm now in particular, it probably wasn't as much in 2007, but she's obviously a really big name and nobody else in the film I recognized. And I liked that because I just thought, oh, these people were in this bar and in this setting. But then every time she'd come on screen, I'd say, oh, then there's Tilda Swinton <laughs> popping up again in this very odd movie. Um, the second thing is I got there's the characters, the actors are mostly Hungarian, like Belatar, but it's set in France. I think they're dubbed in French, but then there's the English aspect because the man who came from London is part of this. So then sometimes they're actually speaking English. And I have to say a few times I got pretty mixed up on what was going on and there's not really a lot of plot per se. So it's not that big of a deal, but that kind yeah. of took me out of it. The dubbing, the French dubbing took me out of it a little bit. Yeah, there's a little bit of a Sergio Leone feel to it where everyone seems dubbed whether they need it to be or not. It's kind of the feeling. Um, and that could be distracting, I think. Um, I, I did love this film. It wasn't on par with Damnation for me. To me, Damnation is a masterpiece. This is uh, an excellent, beautiful film in, in my mind. And, you, you touched on something that has been in both of these films that I love, and that's that he uses those long takes to create tension. And, and it's odd that he's able to do that. He and Agnes, his co-director here, because um, usually these long takes uh, are boring. And, and somehow here, they, they even give me almost a sense of anxiety because you're not sure what's at the end of the take. And um, the first 30 minutes of this film, I could probably watch on a loop. The first 14 seem to be one shot. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they are, but it sure is made to look like it's a single shot. And then he does this interesting thing with the camera where uh, the camera moves faster than the shift in the focal point of the camera. And I, I'd love for maybe a cinematographer to write in and tell us how he may have done that. It's almost as if he's moving the camera at this fast rate, but also sort of tilting it backwards so that the focal point yeah. doesn't shift. And I, as I was watching it, I, and I watched it, that scene three or four times, the movie itself twice, and I still don't know how he did it. It's, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. And, and it's also a little jarring, which I think is what he yeah. wants you. He wants you to be unsettled. He doesn't want you to be bored. He wants you to be unsettled, which you definitely are. There's not a lot of character development here. This main the character, he has a daughter um, who is, you know, very protective of, um, he has this briefcase. We don't even really know, he did, we don't know that he has any sort of, inter we don't know exactly what his internal struggle is and we don't know um, his motivation. I mean, obviously the motivation is money but he doesn't really do anything with it, you know and right. he doesn't seem to have a plan for what he's doing with it. Yeah, and except maybe take care of his daughter but even that seems, he seems um, like off base in the way that he's doing it. So it's as if he, he buys her a fur, which seems like yeah. a pretty odd thing to do, especially when they're living in such poverty that that's not going to stick out a little bit. But um, yeah, he doesn't really have a plan. And so I think people that are interested in a lot of character development would find this really frustrating. And I think at times it was for me more. So he has these themes, you know, that I think, I, you know, there is a lot of hopelessness in the film. But as it went on, I also thought there was like themes of redemption that I thought were really interesting. I have not seen Damnation, which you said was a masterpiece. What is it about it that you found so compelling? Because critics, Bellatar is very divisive, but for the most part, he's definitely a director where critics love his movie, the general public's like, what? You know, so, I mean, there's definitely that divide. So I'm curious what you thought of, what it was it about Damnation that um, struck you? Uh, well, what's interesting is compared to Damnation, this is an action picture. <laughs> Damnation's shots are even longer and slower. Um, and there's a bit more realism to it. Uh, the camera is less obtrusive in Damnation than it is here. In fact, the first time I went through this film, it, um, it was a little jarring to me because the camera is so noticeable and it's much less noticeable in Damnation. He's, he's a great filmer of, of or a capturer of nature in that film. Uh, and I don't mean beautiful nature, I mean the way rain falls on rocks or down a stone mm -hmm. building or uh, what mud might feel like when it's, you know, up to your ankles, you sort of get that feeling in damnation. And, and in fact, I wasn't, I haven't been that taken by a film since um, In the Mood for Love, the first time I saw that. Oh, wow. That's a high compliment. Yeah. To me, it's that beautiful in a much darker way. I mean, 
in in the mood for love is aesthetically pleasing. This one um, is less aesthetically pleasing, but but really gets to the heart of something with the simple use of visuals. Um, mm -hmm. I say simple. I, I know it it was difficult to construct, but um, but yeah, there's long takes in that that end up not being anything, but you you sort of are happy when they're over because of that tension he creates. Um, right. I think and, that beginning and, scene with the two in this one with the men in the suitcase and you're all leaning in like what's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. The other thing I like uh, more about Damnation than this film is uh, almost all of the music and external sounds are at least appear to be diegetic and and here there's a fairly obtrusive score. Um, at it times. surprised me. Yeah and and so I I liked the less is more aspect of, of damnation. I will highlight one more film, one more scene from this film, which stands out because um, he and his daughter are having this difficult conversation in the bar and then the uh -huh. camera moves and you see that this melancholy accordion music that's been playing is diegetic, it's there in the bar. And there's these two men dancing and one is balancing a billiard ball on his nose and the other man is holding a chair. And it feels like out of another movie and it is like a breath, like he gives you this slight breathe to all the heaviness and right. let you know that there's more going on in this world than this than this plot. And, I liked that aspect. Also the English, was he English? I don't know, the, the detective. Yes. If he was a detective, he was a detective. He also seemed sort of like he was paid off by who this yeah. theater owner or whatever, but he was a very odd character. He really stuck out. He seems like he is also in a different movie um, than the other characters. Yeah. Everyone else is very stone-faced and just like, heavy and like woe is me eastern european yeah. cinema feeling <laughs> and he is and he's also a little bit stone-faced but he's very just like okay let's get this done you know he's he's just yeah. this very, totally different personality than all the other characters and it really jarred me quite a bit actually yeah he definitely doesn't care about the morality of the situation he only cares about retrieving the money essentially which is the i would say MacGuffin or the the item in this movie that is, that is central and, and that's part of what I like about Tar also is there is a clear morality in his films. However, his characters rarely meet it. They rarely meet yeah, it. Yeah, it's true. And, and they don't, and there's not much judgment about that. It's just sort of the way I think he believes the world works, kind of an existential perspective that, that I appreciated. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely true. Well, so is this four stars for you? Yes, this one is four, and Damnation gets the very rare five stars from me, which I pull out of my pocket when something uh, yeah, it's just astounds classic, me. Right? But yeah. yeah, this one, uh, this one I loved enough that I'm going to have it on in the background when I'm doing a lot of things. I have a feeling just so I can. Oh well, uh, just it's a good out. winter movie, I guess. Or uh, <laughs> <Yes>. yeah, <laughs> okay. So we'll move on to our next movie, um, which is the one that I picked for this episode. Uh, we each picked one. I forgot to mention that at the top show. Um, this one is Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets from 2020. Um, this was a film I was really excited about when I saw it popping up on a few critics end of the year list. This is by the Bro Ross brothers who are uh, uh, directorial brothers, you know, like the Coen brothers and these other brothers that direct movies together that I just recently became acquainted with through the Criterion channel. I started watching some of their films, quite a few of their films are on there. And I became really fascinated with their style and then found out they had a new movie um, which is about a group of uh, people uh, gathering in a bar uh, in Las Vegas, um, and we'll get to that in a minute, whether it's actually in Las Vegas or not, um, on its last night before it closes. And the film literally just um, films them over, a, you know, over the entire day and the entire night until the bar closes. Now, what the Ross, this movie has, if you look it up, it will show you on, um, for instance, on Amazon, which is where I watched it, it, was, it, it lists it as a comedy, comedy slash documentary. <laughs> I don't know why, but neither of those are really true. This is not really a documentary, um, but it's not really not a documentary. And this is what I found really interesting about it. They, the Ross brothers did a similar technique with a previous film they did um, on a uh, Chapatulas, um, you know, which is where they're from. They're from New Orleans. And so they did a previous film which followed a young boy with his, his brothers just uh, walking the streets of New Orleans one night after um, they miss the ferry back to their house. And that film is fantastic. It also has these moments where you start to realize you think it's a documentary because you just start following these young guys and it's obviously in their family home. It feels very real. 
Um, but then there's these moments where you think, oh, wait, is this a documentary? So Bloody Nose and Empty Pockets is very much that kind of film. Um, so it has multiple characters uh, who are these denizens of this bar, they're regulars at the bar. Michael, who is a, is a, a former actor who is possibly homeless, you definitely get the sense he spent more than one night sleeping his entire night on the couch of the bar. Um, Peter, a musician um, who is, uh, even has tattoos on his eyelids, but is actually a pretty happy-go-lucky character compared to some of these other folks. The bartender, Shay, who is a working mom, whose uh, teenage son is hanging outside the bar uh, while she's working on this last night, and she's trying to keep him from getting in trouble. Uh, a, a, a veteran, a Vietnam vet, um, a black trans woman who comes in and has a great dynamic with Michael and they've had a long time friendship. So you have all these just great rich characters and um, they're really drinking. It's filmed in a real bar. <laughs> um, um, but, and I'm giving this away because I think that there, I saw a lot of reviews online from people that felt very angry when they found out that, that this, this wasn't quote unquote, just a straight documentary. These were all people that were cast from actual bars in New Orleans and then put together in this bar and um, it called the Roaring Twenties was the name of the bar and they just started filming them but they didn't have a previous relationship to one another and the drinks are flowing that's all real and the filmmakers filmed the real conversations and everything they're doing. Um, I watched this movie with my husband we loved it we talked about it for hours after it was over, we could not stop talking about this movie. I'm so excited to hear what you thought because I, I, I picked this, Brian, because I know of your love of great old dive bars and, um, and I just went off the description and I thought it was a documentary when I picked it. So I'm super interested to hear what you say. Yeah, yeah, I, it, this was a great pick and thank you because I may not have found it otherwise. And I, I loved it. Um, I, the issue of whether it's a documentary or not didn't bother me. Um, I had listened to some commentators talk about it and they brought up that issue. So I knew as I watched it that that, that, that was of this piece. Um, that, for me, that doesn't matter. They are trying to evoke a certain feeling and, right, exactly. and they do that in this film. And that's all that really mattered to me. That classification is, uh, you know, for lists and channels like Amazon that need to right, exactly something. Um, so yes. and. Actually, it not being a documentary makes this a technical marvel to me. I don't know how, unless they had endless footage, that they were able to get in on these beautiful, natural, strange conversations um, in the midst of sort of chaos, because it's kind of a celebration with the closing of the bar. I shouldn't say a celebration. It's more uh, like a celebration of life since this right. bar it's is It's a closing. funeral slash celebration, yes. yeah. yeah. And we have these interesting characters like Michael who seems to be uh, a self-appointed caretaker of the bar. Like he even wants to clean up toward the end. And he even seems um, a little bit cranky that he doesn't get to help uh, this mm -hmm. one final time. Um, I really took to Bruce, the Vietnam veteran that you were talking about. Great who, character, yeah. Yeah, he's so um, rich and emotive in this film. I, I really took to him uh, very He much. had one of the most heartbreaking scenes too when he's leaving. Oh yeah. I got and very choked up. I mean, that's the thing that's really real about the film, right? Is what yes. feelings it elicits in you. And I really got choked up during yeah. that scene. And, you know, and it gets, uh, as you mentioned, I enjoy dive bars very much. It, it gets so many things just right. I wrote down a, a couple of things um, it gets the shift change just right when the when the one bartender leaves the morning shift mm -hmm. and, the, and the later one comes. Uh, it gets that sort of ebb in energy um, that comes and goes over the course of a long night in a bar. And it also gets sort of shifting affections, right? You know, over the course of this night, Michael is very close to one character. And then later in the night, he seems to be ignoring this character for someone else. Uh, and not out of not out of anything um, nefarious. It's just sort of the way those nights go. You kind of shift your from group to group throughout the night, and those uh, those affections sort of sort of shift. Um, and then I love the sort of energetic affirmations that people would give to um, unimportant topics, but this energy behind the way people will agree or try and support one another in these situations. Um, 
I would say the only thing, I have two small complaints about the film, if you don't mind if I get into that. Terry. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested. Um, one is they do these exterior um, sort of transition shots of Las Vegas uh, to, to set that as the setting for this bar. And I felt like those hindered the film in a way because I wanted this to be sort of every bar in any town. And mm -hmm. setting it so strictly in Las Vegas, I thought, at least hindered that for me. Um, hmm. And uh, the other thing I thought, I thought they were a little bit on the nose with this being a cautionary tale about hanging out at bars. And I'm probably hmm. uh, a little prejudiced because I like that environment very much. And I have a strong affection for it. And I feel like the cautionary parts are pretty self-evident. Mm -hmm. But they have the Mike character give a couple of speeches and someone else will give a speech about how you gotta stop hanging out at these places and stuff like that. Yeah, the scene with Peter, Peter is the musician when he's laying on top of Mike and they're both wasted and Michael says to him, you gotta stop hanging out at these places. And you know, you gotta, you're young, don't become like me, you know, you're right. That was sort of already evident. I felt like that was a play more at viewers like me who are sort of in the middle. I'm definitely not an anti-bar person. I'm not a teetotaler, but I'm not, I have had my fair share of being uncomfortable in bars with drunken be people and drunken behavior. Yes. And so I, you know, there was aspects that to me, when you're watching that, the woman that kept showing her breasts anytime she could possibly <laughs> yeah, yeah. do it. So I, I guess I thought that was interesting, um, but maybe it didn't need to be said. Maybe it was just sort of obvious that part of it was kind of sad too, that this is where people are, some of these people are spending their lives. But there's also sadness about a lack of, a loss of a community space, so. Yeah, I, and I've had those very conversations. I mean, we had a bar in our town, Pete's Place, that closed. And I, I remember having conversations that, that it's almost like they transcribed them for this film. Like, where is so-and-so going to hang out after Pete's is gone? Or where am right, I where are they going to go? Yeah, so you, yeah. there was a lot of it that felt very authentic to you. So yes. how many stars are you going to give it, Brian? I know we have to wrap up, so. Yeah, well, uh, my apologies as I rambled on there. But no, I, no, no, I, I would give this four stars in spite of those couple of... Um, hesitations I have I thought overall it's a technical marvel a great film yeah I loved it too I'm also giving it this definitely a four-star movie for me so um thank you so much Brian for joining me again on the show it was so much fun to talk to you about these movies and hopefully we'll have you back soon to talk about some more so, so as always here. thank you uh we'll go to realfilmsnobs.com youtube for our uh, reviews thank you to our fantastic sponsors crew everyone out there in the world <laughs> watching as always have a great day and great movies Thank <laughs> you.